Uh, hi everyone, I'm Pradeep Ramachandran. This is my first VDD here, so probably a new face to several of you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk about uh, what we've been doing with X265 over the last year. I am with MultiCoreware, as you can guess by my affiliation on the title. Um, so I thought we'll start with a chart that kind of shows where we have gone from our old presets, which are shown, uh, this is a scatter plot showing relative quality. We measured with what we call as BDSSIM. We have actually adopted BDPSNR and made it into BDSSIM because SSIM just makes a little more sense for us. And this is relative uh, quality with respect to very slow. On the left side top is the old very slow and our X axis is the relative quality, relative speed with respect to old very slow. So anything on the right means you've gone faster. Uh, the red dots represent our different presets that try to trade off performance and efficiency, which the, f they, the red dots show where we were, and the right side dots, which are the green dots, show where we are. So as you can see, over the last year, our encoder performance has grown by more than 2x on both servers and desktops. So I would encourage you to redo some of your tests to see what our speeds look like today. And while I'm showing uh, metrics here, because in a slide, it makes a little more, it makes it a little more attractive to look at metrics. We actually do tune most of our features to improve visual quality, right? So this is my only marketing slide that I will talk about. And I want to start to dig, dig into showing what really cost this, right? So uh, over the last one year, we've been focusing heavily to optimize the algorithms that we have inside uh, X265. And uh, before I get into what exactly we have done, I'll be highlighting a couple of them and talking briefly about some more. Let's just have a quick one slide primer on what HEVC enables and why it enables higher efficiency. As most of you know, this is probably a repeat. HEVC has block sizes from 64 by 64. So you have a quad tree that lets you choose blocks from 64 by 64 to 32, 16, and 8. And the split is actually what gives you much better efficiency. Um, you're, and it's good because when you have less complex blocks, you can choose much larger blocks. So use le much less bits and you can go all the way down. So this is great, but you know, there's a flip side. This is also the most time consuming portion of our entire encoder. And what we do with X265 is at different presets, we try to figure out when can I skip this split? Can I be intelligent about the way that I actually skip these splits? And the one of the two algorithms that I will highlight today. The first one is called a new recursion skip algorithm that focuses on our high quality presets. So we have two RD levels, our rate distortion levels five and six, which are pretty much the same today. We have given two numbers so that in the future we can optimize them a little better. But for offline encoding today, primarily our rate distortion levels five and six are used. Our very slow presets, which is our flagship preset, actually uses rate distortion level five. The new R skip algorithm, what it tries to do is in relation to the past, I'll explain this with respect to the graph here, it's a little easier to understand. So the y-axis shows a relative encode efficiency. The blue point here is the 1.0, which shows efficiency and relative speed when you don't have any recursion skip. So you're walking down the entire quad tree from 64 by 64 to 32, 16, 8, figuring out optimal costs and then recursing out, right? So the old way that we had R skip implemented, our goal was to try and see can we go better in performance? So for three different 4K videos tuned here, you can see that, you know, we actually were doing much better than what the default no R skip was doing. But then we figured that, you know, the problem with the no R skip and our older implementation, implementation of R skip was that we were skipping recursion too early. And that was a problem, right? So we moved some of our cost computation out. And interestingly, what we had was we not only got better quality than the old R skip, we even got better quality than the exhaustive search. And that's pretty interesting, right? Because you would think that, you know, if you skipped, you will lose quality. But what actually was happening was because when you were doing exhaustive search, you were ending up with a local minimum because you took some decision somewhere in the middle that was not correct. And when you tried skipping some stuff and introducing some randomness, you actually end up with a global minimum. So you see here the green dots, which is our new RD levels five and six, have lost some speed with respect to the old R skip, but because these are for offline encoding, some loss of speed is not too much of a problem, but we get much better quality. And that really is what enables 
much better visual uh, quality as you can see. In fact, for some test clips which we had shared with the community over our uh, mailing list, uh, the visual difference is just stunning, right? It looks, you can actually see ripples in the water much better today than you could even see earlier with X265. On the flip side, we have uh, RD level zero to four, whose focus is on higher performance and not so much on quality. Of course, we don't want to give up quality. You don't want crappy video, but you want to get closer to getting much better performance. And for this one uh, optimization that we introduced was to try and see, can I use a measure of homogeneity within a particular CU block and say that, you know, let's say you have a 32 by 32. If I can figure out that this, that this block is homogeneous, you don't need to split it. Because even if you split it, your cost is going to say that splitting is more expensive. So a cheaper computation, which is homogeneity, actually results in losing no encode efficiency shown in the red line, plotted on the right side, but gaining performance of up to 20% or even up to 35%, depending on what you actually are uh, encoding. And this is all for 4K. These are tuned for 4K, right? So these are two algorithms that actually shows considerable improvement in both encoding speed and quality. Uh, one additional feature that we've been working on in X265 over the last one year is to add support for new architectures. As uh, Deepthi had spoken about last year, we have used SSE, AVX, AVX2 kernels for x86. We've seen significant speed ups, you know, kernels, specific kernels gave up to like 90x improvement depending on the complexity of the kernel. And overall our encoder gains on x86 were close to 5x depending on, of course, what you're running and what uh, exact hardware you're using, blah, blah. But it's pretty, pretty darn impressive. And so we've seen that ARM is slowly emerging as a server competitor. And uh, I think it's an important game that ARM is, important step that ARM is trying to take. We have started adding support for ARM in X265. We have already pushed quite a few patches. We started with supporting cross compilation, but we also support native compilation today. Uh, our first round of kernel optimizations, we are seeing close to 40% encoder performance. We are nowhere close to the 5x that we got with x86. Interestingly, for the same kernels, and I was talking about this to some of the folks here, that we are seeing much lower gains in ARM than we were seeing with x86. Now, I'm not sure if that's to do with algorithms or with just lower ILP or ARM. We're not sure. Something that, you know, we are trying to get help from people to take a look at. But um, the ARM experience has been pretty interesting for us overall because there's a lot of people who are interested to see ARM take on x86 in the server space and, you know, eat some of their uh, market cap, which I think is an interesting role for them to try. We also started uh, supporting power. So some patches have already been shared by IBM in our mailing list to add Altivec optimizations for Power 8. These are some things that we'll be testing them and we have to start enabling support for Power 8 as well. There's also an open call in our, uh, there's a bounty up which includes a reasonably big number for Im implementing some RTVEC optimizations. And if anybody is interested to get access to a Power 8 cloud, there's also details on x265.org that you can see. Um, some other improvements that we've been working on over the last year, we've improved our grain handling overall. There's been a lot of interest in trying to you know, make sure that film grain is retained. I know that some of you in the audience who come from big companies who are responsible to take film and make sure that they're available OTT, uh, they need good grain uh, handling. We have fully refactored our tuned grain to enable better QP control. In fact, we have a new rate control grain, which focuses on ensuring that your rate control doesn't get completely jumpy all over the place when grain comes in. Right, so if you are testing uh, X265 with grain, grainy videos, try out Tune Grain. We'd love to hear what you think it looks like. And if there are any uh, problems that you see, please talk to us about it and we can see what we can do. We've also added improved support for handling frame level QPs. We now support min and max QP support, much like what X264 has within each frame. Uh, we have also improved a long standing issue with X265 that people have complained about where your very first frame, if it was very complicated, X265 used to not do a good job. Basically the QP became too high and from then on it was just toast, right? Because your first frame, which is iframe is bad, your predictions completely get thrown off and you don't know what to do. This has been improved and uh, we've got good feedback about this. And yeah, please do try this out as well. And if there's anything you'd like us to look at, any problematic clips, please do let us know. We today also support QG size of eight, in a, this is a quantization group size of eight 
in addition to 64, 32, and 16 that we used to support. Now, this is important, especially for low resolution videos, because the chances that you'll use lower blocks, smaller block sizes are higher for low resolution videos, and which means that supporting a quantization group of smaller sizes makes it also better overall. We've added support for HDR, including uh, specifying Luma clipping, because it's becoming increasingly clear that 4K with HDR is really giving the wow that they expect from 4K. So most 4K TVs today actually ship with HDR. So supporting HDR is important. We also today support UHD Blu-ray. So there's an option in our Param and our CLI that enables support for UHD Blu-ray in the uh, bitstream that's emitted. We've also implemented a parallelized version of a few filters. Uh, it was non-trivial work. We did not get great speed ups because the amount of juice left in that orange was not too much, but it's also already implemented and it's completely parallelized today in X265. So where are we headed? We continue to focus on both algorithms to improve both performance and quality. Right? We don't rest until we get it as fast and as best as possible. Particularly, we're focusing a lot of our optimizations on low bit rates and low resolutions because as the market spreads towards countries where there is lesser bandwidth, it becomes more important to make sure that lower resolutions are handled very well and lower bitrate encodes have to look very good. Uh, we are working on a special tune low res option within our parameter set that sets specific parameters to make sure that you know low res videos look better when encoded with X265. Is that a question? No? Okay. Uh, we also are improving our grain handling through scaling lists. HEVC supports scaling list by default. We have some basic support for scaling list, but grain support through scaling list is something which we think can really change the game. So we're working on this. Uh, we have a multipass algorithm today that primarily focuses on sharing rate control information from one pass to the next, but it doesn't really share any analysis information, which we think could be beneficial to improve the quality in the second pass, not just rate control. And you know, you could probably search a little more of the tree than you did in the first pass if you shared analysis intelligently, something we're looking at. Of course, our support for new architectures continues. We have only started knocking the arm doors, so we want to try to continue doing that. Altivec is something that we are also going to be working on. And we'd love to hear more from you as to what you think we need to be looking at. We are always available to hear your thoughts, comments, etc. Uh, I thought about whether I should put this slide or not, because you know, come standing here talking about X265 and putting a slide up saying limitations of X265. But hey, you know what? I got to be honest, what X265 cannot do, right? One big problem with X265 today is that it doesn't scale beyond 20 threads. Right. Up to 20 threads, you know, we can actually do pretty well, scales up. We have enough thread level parallelism, frame level parallelism, uh, and it does pretty well. The problem there is that without being able to scale up, we cannot sustain 10-bit 4K 60 FPS, which is a requirement for being able to do broadcast. So directly using X265 is not an option for doing broadcast today. We can do 4K 30 in some configurations, but going past that with X265 is hard. We could go to slices. Uh, supporting multiple slices will help, but you know, quality really suffers if you do that. Second problem is that for streaming media servers, uh, they need the support to do multiple streams. We have heard people saying that they parallelly encode up to 32 plus streams. I don't know if you have bigger numbers, anybody knows 100 streams being encoded in parallel. Uh, I guess it's just up there as to how many you want to encode. But the bottom line is you could use multiple X265s for this. But it's kind of stupid to do because, you know, a lot of these streams are very similar in nature, just slight differences in bitrate or in CRF settings. So if you could avoid the repetition of work, you could actually gain a lot, right? Um, the third problem with X265 today is that when you want to do real-time streaming, you have to, with X265 and several other encoders, set a worst-case setting so that all possible inputs are actually handled. Right. The problem there is that if your input is much simpler, you could get a lot higher FPS, but it's not really useful because you want to do real time. So if there is a way to dynamically reconfigure the content and reconfigure the encoder to adapt to the content, that's the best thing. Now, as you can guess, I'm leading towards another product that we have now called UHT Kit. So what UHT Kit is, is it takes X265 and enables commercial use it addresses all the limitations that we spoke about in the previous slide. 
Okay. <laughs> so X265 remains the heart of UST kit. So UST kit is not a new encoder. X265 is the heart of UST kit. It just builds a framework around X265 using all the goodness that X265 offers to be able to address real time, multi encoder and constant performance. All changes that we do inside X265 for UST kit continue to be contributed to open source. You would have seen a few patches already coming in. This includes improvements to the core encoder because we sometimes see that, you know, if you're still not able to hit enough speed, we figure new algorithms like what we spoke about will help and they go back into X265. Any API changes that we require, any API changes that we require also go back straight into X265. But UST kit is only a framework around X265 and we do not, even in UST kit, maintain any private folks, period. Right. We, we promise we do that and we continue with that. So I just want to give a brief flavor for, we have four flavors of UST kit. I want to briefly talk about what each flavor does. Uh, first is an adaptive bitrate encoder. What we do here is to try to encode to multiple quality tiers. The focus here is on streaming. Uh, the, as you can see here, what UST kit is doing is it, in, it instantiates multiple versions of X265, which is the core of the encoder itself. But instead of them being completely independent, the master encoder, which is kind of leading the way, tries to give analysis information from it to the other encoders. And by doing this, when we encode up to four streams at the same resolution in parallel, we get more than 2x performance gains. Right? So this is an interesting way to be able to enable multiple bit streams. Now, the reason I'm saying same resolution, as you can guess, is because today we support only same resolution. So there's other additional work that needs to happen to be able to support other resolutions as well. We also have a parallel encoder, which is a simple split and stitch, but takes it a little bit further, where the incoming stream is split into multiple streams that are encoded in parallel by multiple X265s and stitched together to produce a final bit stream. There are two challenges here. First, we need to make sure that each X265 instance is not hindering the, pro the progress of the other X265 instance. Otherwise, you'll end up into cache trashing and all kinds of problems that you don't want to get into. So you need to make sure that you pin the threads correctly and you handle resource as well. Second problem is that if you do a simple split and stitch, as all of you will guess, at the boundary, the video will look really bad because you're losing rate control information. So the way we handle this is to split rate control out of these guys into a common rate control module that has like a global picture of the whole scene. And he's feeding rate control information into each of these X265 instances. This is still in the works, it's not done yet, but we, with an initial implementation, have been able to sustain 4K 10 bit 60 FPS, actually more than 60 FPS, at 20 plus megabits per second on an off the shelf dual socket Broadwell V4 today. Right? And uh, this is not just, I'm not just cherry picking videos on pretty much any 4K video, we've been able to sustain this. So if you have a 4K video you'd like to test this on, I'm, I'm ready for the challenge. Uh, we also have a maximum quality real-time encoder here. What we have here is another um, X265 instance, but a control system that's monitoring your system resources and your output frame rate. And if it figures that you're actually meeting your FPS and going well above your target FPS, it reconfigures X265 to make sure that quality bumps up. So what does this enable? You can use aggressive settings by default. And if your scene is simple, you're getting improved quality because with respect to conservative settings, your quality is much better. If a scene is complex, your aggressive settings might have resulted in drop in uh, frames, but because we reconfigure, we actually don't drop frames anymore. So we drop to conservative settings only in those small frames, which actually have much more complicated scenes. The fourth flavor of uh, UHT kit is a capped VBR encode, which is effectively a two pass CRF plus VBV but instead of having to encode the entire frame, entire uh, video again, what we do is we select only those gops and frames which actually see a considerable a quality hit because of VBV and re-encode only those frames. Right? So this is a considerable saving of overall encode time when compared to a full two pass by being a little intelligent about how we go. So before I go to my conclusion, uh, this has been one question that I always get that everybody always thinks about what's going on with industry adoption of HEVC. So I thought, you know, I'll spend a slide talking about it. We believe 
it's our belief that HEVC is, is, is really a, a technology that's industry changing, right? Uh, there was a Netflix study released yesterday which showed that we use 35 to 53% less bits than X264 and about 20% less bits than VP9. And this was tuned for visual quality. I can, uh, I'm sure you can see some of the results from the Netflix blog itself. And uh, we are seeing hardware implementations of both encoders and decoders coming out today. Uh, Intel Skylake already has an 8-bit decoder and encoder implementation. They just announced that uh, KB Lake, which is supposed to come 2017, 7th gen, will have a 10-bit decoder implementation, which is supposed to do 4K60. Let's see how, how well it can do. And they also have support for an encoder. So slowly the industry started to walk towards HEVC. Uh, but while the revised royalty terms that came out at the beginning of the year, uh, late last year were much better than the initial spin, it still needs to become much better, right? There's still the patent uh, royalties that need to be paid for HEVC are still very high. And we're trying to nudge this along, right? We have uh, put out a blog post on x265.org, taking, uh, putting a stake in the ground, saying that all software implementations of HEVC should be free. Don't charge for the streams. That's just not done. It just wouldn't work. And try to charge only for hardware implementations, right? So we put a stake in the ground. There's been mixed, mixed responses to this, as you can imagine. But uh, we're taking a stand and we'd like to see whether industries, whether the HEVC patents are willing to meet us halfway. And that's kind of where we stand. So in conclusion, um, we are we tagged 2.0 late July and uh, new versions are coming up. We are supporting new architectures, low bitrate optimization is something that we are focusing on. I really appreciate all the feedback that we've been getting, looking to see more of you trying to contribute to X265. I'd love to hear from you. We are executing UHD kit as a commercial strategy for HEVC. Uh, again, X265 remains the encoding heart of UHD kit. It's a framework around X265. And all enhancements to X265 continue to be contributed towards open source. You can see all the patches coming in on the video land mailing list and on our Bitbucket. We are hoping to see an imminent ramp of HEVC adoption. Hopefully the uh, licensing terms become a lot more conducive for people to use it. And you can always reach us at our mailing list on VideoLAN, at Bitbucket, Doom9, send a note to me, IRC, we are available at all places that you can see. That's all I had. If you had any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. <laughs> yes, Luca. So, in theory, you would be able to provide uh, many of those improvements swapping uh, the code to something else, or even as a part in a different color using the same strategy. Ideally, yes, it, it should be possible. Uh, but today, the implementation of UHD kit is only with X265. For some codecs, some flavors of UHD kit might not make sense. Like, for example, for X264, doing parallel encoding, I don't think makes sense. It's fast enough, it's really fast, right? Uh, some other flavors might make sense. The uh, constant performance encoder might make sense, but that's a proper, uh, you know, it's a proper close loop control system that needs to be tuned a little more carefully. Yes, but your point is taken that there could be flavors of UHT kit that you could replace X265 with some other encoder and it could work. It's possible. Any other questions? Yes. No, no, it's a fully threaded. It's fully threaded, right? So earlier, earlier the implementation used to wait for the full frame to finish before the SAO and the loop filter started. But now we just finish one row and as the rows finish and the rows are happening in parallel according to wavefront parallel parallelism, we continuously encode it. We continuously do the block, the SAO and the deblocking filters. So it's not, it's not waiting on the frame to finish before you actually start the filters. A little bit skeptical. I, I think you're cherry picking the results that they showed. Okay. Why do you say that? This is quoting from a direct slide that they had, right? 
it's it's a slide you're showing the visual results and then 1822 as if that's the range of results that they showed in the whole study. I don't think that's true. I think yeah, this is one of the results that they showed. And okay, so. They showed multiple results in multiple metrics, and the result is multiple metrics is not really Yeah, sure. Uh, so, this is one particular result that I was quoting, right? Right. So, like in other metrics, this was not the range that they showed, right? If you go along the slide set. Uh, this is only this particular result, right? I, I don't have the whole slide set here. Okay, so if, if, if you go along the slide set in their results. Okay. Okay. Right, so depending on the metric that you use, the results are different. And so that's why I'm saying I'm a little bit skeptical that you're cherry picking results in a way that makes you look more favorable than it actually is across the whole study that So so that, that's why I'm saying I'm a little bit skeptical that you're over cherry picking to make it look better. So we, we we can and I'm sure we will talk offline about this. I don't think I'm being completely unfair, okay? Uh, so I'll let people to go back and take a look at the Netflix study as well, but your point, I mean, I'm not being completely unfair. I think it's fairly representative, but we can chat more about this offline, okay? Uh, just, I, I, I think my point is people, like, like if, if people want to take this as a point, that they want to quote elsewhere, I think they should be Yeah, that I, that I completely, that, that I agree, that, that, I, that, that I completely agree with you, right? Yes. Any other questions? No? There was one more? Yeah? You're using the encoder, uh, using the hardware encoders directly? Uh, from what I know, I could be wrong, but they don't expose uh, through their APIs any intermediate stage in their encode for HEVC. I don't think they do. Uh, maybe they do. If they do, I'm willing to look at it. But at this point, I think they only support an end-to-end -end encode where you provide in a raw NV12 in their format. They also provide conversion from YUV to NV12 and they provide you HEVC. So they don't give you intermediate results that you can use. I, if I didn't answer your question correctly, then let's talk offline to try and answer because I've been kicked out here. Yeah? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for your time.